I'm not sure if we should have done a trigger warning at the beginning of the last episode. <laughs> but I know it's late, but we would like to say this is disturbing material. We're referencing it in a very jokingly matter, um, just because of how much respect we have for the story. Uh, and it's told very well. But if this is too much for you, feel free to you know not listen to this, right? Uh, I definitely want to put that up top. Welcome to Casuals of Runeterra, episode 80. I'm your host, Ryan, here with your other host, Hetch. Our, our show is getting so nice and up there in episode age now. <laughs> yeah, dude. Our, our baby's growing. We're veterans at this point, right? Crazy. Crazy. It's wild. Um, and and as veterans, we get to take creative liberties. We do get to take creative liberties. <laughs> which, means, which means another episode of No Yordles. <laughs> yeah, we're going to keep it going. We promised another gin episode. Here it is. But we always promise that up top we'll have housekeeping. Here it is. You can listen to us everywhere. You can send an email to podcastcore at gmail.com. Visit us at podcastcore.com for all of our info. And then follow us on any platform you prefer or all the platforms because that helps us get some discoverability. Uh, leave a like, follow comment, short review, wherever you're listening. Uh, but the easiest way is to tell a friend to prepare for their stage debut by listening to the Casuals of Runeterra podcast. And that's not a threat. I know the contents of our show. <laughs> it's just a play, on the, it's a play on the content. It's not a threat. <laughs> no, it's a stage debut. Just act like you're auditioning for... <laughs> You know, to do a guest episode with us here at the Casuals, we're not going to kill you. We're going to kill the fourth guy, not you. <laughs> yeah. So um, today we're diving back into Jin with the man with the steel cane, a story Hetch has wanted to talk about for a while now. Yeah, uh, a little like behind the scenes pick, uh, a peek for our show is that I have been talking about this comic like specifically with ryan like ever since oh god i think ever since like um they started doing like the new shin cards uh well the new like the first block where we got new cards for ionia mm -hmm. um so it was when we got um oh goodness it was so long ago now but when we were getting our first batch of new champions and i was like it's gonna be Jin, it's gonna be Jin." <laughs> and a big part of this was because of this story yeah. and fast forward to year 2022 i'm finally right <laughs> <laughs> at some point it's like the stock market at some point stocks only go up <laughs> Don't look at how far down they had to go before they start going up, but they'll go up. <laughs> but we're going to get right into it because we have a lot of content here and some stuff that we've wanted to talk about since our last episode that we put, we held off on till this one to not spoil too much. Um, but like all good stories, I tend to prefer a story in three parts, but we know Jin, so we have four acts. And we start with one. So where we start here is we get an artistic description of Jin's gun. And we know from the game, the gun's name is Whisper. And he thinks of it as a tool, like a paintbrush. It's not a gun to him. And we also get to see Jin's OCD for the first time, as he must clean his gun four times, and he must do a lot of things four times. And for his gun specifically, this is to ensure that it is quote unquote clean. Yep. And only four times can make it clean. And he even comments to himself that like it that this is kind of um a a bit of like extra TLC. Like he's even aware that this is a little on the extra side, but to him it's worth it because do not the finest painters deserve the finest brushes so the fact that he is maintaining this ocd behavior is to ensure that he has the finest tool 
to create his art because if he is the best artist in his field, he deserves this. Uh, which it also kind of lends into like this egotistical behavior of his. He thinks very highly of himself, and yes. we get that just at the beginning of Act One. Oh, it's quite the intro. Um, and there's some callbacks here. So he mentions that he preferred the gun as a brush over the blade. Um, and also referenced this gun only has four bullets, right? The perfect amount. But when he mentions the gun versus the the, the blade, we get a reference to our previous episode where we talked about how he has training at this point. He's trained with the Kinku Order and at the temples and he's read up and he's no longer he's not a single track mind, just a stage hand anymore. He has skills and he has tools. And this is very important. If you haven't listened to our gen episode, check it out. But it's important to understand that when he was in prison, quote unquote, uh, it was at the Tula monastery. And this is at a time where Ionia didn't even have prisons. Like yeah. it, it wasn't a true prison. So he was allowed to do whatever he wanted there. And that's how he has such a, a, a very intimate understanding of how firearms work as well as using key techniques. So uh, the techniques that the King Ku uh, monk warriors would use, uh, and he used these key techniques into the gun. Um, and this gun is also of finest quality because it comes from the Kushri, the Kushri being the most renowned weaponsmiths of Ionia. So it's very important to understand that he wasn't really in a jail cell. Like, because if you don't understand that, none of this makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you jump to this episode, we ask, why? <laughs> <laughs> let's go back and listen to our last episode four times and then come back here <laughs> so he this not only are his tools important but the acts and the art that he's going to do next is important to him as well so now we get mentions from him about a rehearsal he did previously to coming to this town at a previous mill town um, where he tested out whisper which is his newer tool and he did so because the results of what he's about to do must please his employers. Now, we've referenced his employers um, originally when he was let out of that temple prison. We're still unknown to who they are. We do know that they have some Noxus ties. And in my mind, Black Rose, question mark? I, I honestly can't think of a better explanation because... At this point, especially once you, like with our last episode, we talk about how it even leaves the islands of Ionia, this killing spree, and no one knows who's backing it. And it's a seamlessly endless payroll that you can't track. All signs point to the Black Rose. Like, I, like if you can't hear LeBlanc laughing, you're not paying attention. That, that's how I feel about it. She, yeah. she is laughing somewhere. Off to the side, just like, yes, Jin, <laughs> go, go and do the thing. <laughs> so we get to a, kind of a crescendo of this ritual he's doing to prepare for things, where after he finishes polishing his gun, he begins to suit up. And this is in the clothes that we know Jin from the game, from the art. It's very iconic at this point because it's so unique. And the part we get that is the like the information you weren't quite aware of is when he suits up, it's almost like a ritual of him getting his adrenaline pumping. It's like pre-gaming for what he's about to do. And it's described as him transforming into the gruesome artist that we know as the golden demon. Yeah. Uh, and it's also interesting because part of the ritual and the way that the suit is applied also hinders his abilities. It covers his right eye. It covers his mouth. So it's, constricts his breathing and his depth perception is now thrown off because one of his eyes is covered and when he is describing that the next line is delightful <laughs> like i mean like it's that combination of like getting his adrenaline going like getting ready for the act while also taking a sick pleasure out of every out of all of it like this is something that i 
like at this point it's almost not artistic right like it is just like okay no this is something i'm doing for me at this point like this feels good this yeah. feels right like there's there's not much of an art to that like you if you're hungry you eat like yeah <laughs> there's almost a bestial <laughs> nature to why jen is doing this exactly uh and then this scene is broken up by a maid entering and when she enters, Jin kind of puts away everything and he kind of acts like nothing was going on. And the maid comes in and he asks, you know, have you set everything up for me properly? And he's referencing these lanterns that have to be placed in a very specific order. Um, but he ends up getting distracted after, you know, he's like, okay, she's good. Let me get dressed. He exits the room in a glorious fashion. Um, think about how, like in our Renata episode, we talk about how she enters a room and what that means, right? That sinister presence that is also um, un like you're unable to stop looking away from, right? Um, but he exits and it, it emphasizes the asymmetrical glory of what he's wearing, right? He doesn't like symmetry. Um, things have to be in a certain way, but symmetry tends to distract him and upset him. And he looks into the maid's face as he's talking to her and notices that she's young, cherubic, and has a perfectly symmetrical face. And that is a problem. Uh, which is so funny because that's like a standard beauty uh, a beautiful trait is to have a symmetrical face. And for Jid, it's just like, oh, no, if I removed your face, it would look awful like the art would be <laughs> wrong so it, it kind of gives us a little bit into like why like how he's making these artistic decisions is yeah. because it's like a, you know i gotta pick someone that is perfect for my art but like his art is just like not doesn't even make sense when we are trying to make sense of it uh it, it's counterintuitive to human nature but it is quite funny that is like this is our first insight that's kind of different than, you know, count to four. Yeah. And it just doesn't make any sense. And, but it's kind of overshadowed by the fact that, you know, what the maid is trying to look at at this point is for the crescendo, my darling. <laughs> and we know what Jen's crescendos are like. Yeah. So, you know, he's captivated by the face for a second because of how ugly of a mask it would make if he ripped it off her face <laughs> and then but oh she gosh. has called attention to something we don't know yet and all that Jen tells us is that it's for the crescendo and listen i'm not sure if we should have done a trigger warning at the beginning of the last episode <laughs> but i know it's late but we would like to say this is disturbing material we're referencing it in a very jokingly matter, um, just because of how much respect we have for the story. Uh, and it's told very well. But if this is too much for you, feel free to, you know, not listen to this, right? Uh, I definitely want to put that up top. But to continue the story, um, as Hetch mentioned, there is a point where once his, once she interrupted his ritual of getting ready, it threw off his whole mood. It soured him because he was starting to become concerned about the plan, like the art he was going to do. He started to feel uninspired. It was this downward spiral that he does not like. And her face was just the icing on the cake in a weird way. And he felt like it lacked pizzazz and he needed something for his performance. And this is when all of this dawned on him that he would have to make this maid's face more interesting. Uh, and that's a quote. <laughs> Yep. Uh, so how does he do that? Now, nah, forget that. Let's go to part two. <laughs> we move on to the next act <laughs> in our play where we jump to a scene of Shen, which is unsuspecting. If you haven't listened to our other episodes, listen to those. Um, but we start with Shen uh, enjoying a bowl of soup or preparing to enjoy a bowl of soup or possibly ramen. And he's waiting for the broth to reach its perfect flavor profile to eat. And he notices the atmosphere changes. And w a big warning, um, eat something before you read this paragraph because whoever wrote this is clearly a fan of like all of those good cartoon shows that just make <laughs> food like look way too good and he takes his time to describe why shit is waiting for this bowl of shokugeki. soup oh, shokugeki. <laughs> <laughs> oh no not, okay okay let's not get canceled so <laughs> if you know you know 
Um, so I, I do also want to point out that the writing of this is great because they use the description of Shen waiting for this bowl of soup um, to also give you um, some insight into Shen's personality. Right. Like how he approaches subjects. He's a very somber, kind of boring guy. <laughs> Everything is about balance for him. Like this description of food with Shen waiting for it in one paragraph gives you, hey, this is how Shen is, because later we're going to meet his other half. Um, but yeah, he noticed something's off in the atmosphere because he's a King Ku ninja uh, and he notices Zed walk through the door alone dressed like a merchant entering the inn. And Zed is never alone, especially at this point in the story where he has his own order. Yeah, um, and we touched on it a little bit in our Jed episode, but we really go over it in the Zed episode. But he is now the leader of the Yun, the Yunlei uh, uh, ninja faction. Um, they're not actually called ninja factions, but they're ninjas. So uh, it's yeah. easier to kind of you know give a picture there. But um, as far as like Zed entering in here, we also get, you know, like a little bit of banter back and forth. And at this point, this is after the biography for both Zed and Shin. So for both of their stories, they've had a fallout. It is the the official breakup of the Kenku order. And this is the first time that they've seen each other since this fallout because after zed makes his departure in a very dramatic fashion uh he goes and he finds his own order and he never shows up again because he knows that if he sees shin he's gonna have to kill shin or shin's gonna kill him it's that's it like there's yeah. no way around it so this is the first time that they've got it so the immediate beginning of the banter is shin making fun of zed's students Mm -hmm. Thus making fun of Zed because it's like, yeah, like, you know, you suck at this and I hate you. <laughs> and then it's Shin going, I years I have waited for this. And then Zed like, oh, have I misjudged the distance? And then we get a breakdown of how Zed and Shin are both counting the number of paces yeah. and the distance that they're going to be at each other if either one of them tries to kill each other right here. This so, is... It's, the tension is just palatable at classic this point. spaghetti western right this is classic standoff where it's two skilled people in a very normal environment preparing for something that could be catastrophic right the death of either one in a quick success like in a quick moment and like hedge said they're having this discussion there is a decision that zed makes and shen notices that zed looks worn out he looks tired um, while he's, you know, talking his shit kind of thing. And he tells Shen, one thing he tells him is like, you and I are similar, right? And not only are we similar, I know you hate me for killing your father, and I don't care. So on top of that, the golden, golden demon has escaped. It's just layers of trauma in a moment so concentrated, that's so tense, that could only be delivered by Zed because that's his personality. Yeah, and and it is important here as far as like, you know, with Zed picking at the nerve that Shin is more like Zed is because Zed killed Kusho, uh, his father, and Kusho was the embodiment of the Kinku order of just, you, we only work to speak balance out the spiritual realm that's we only work for that balance and so now that shin is in charge of this kinku order and the kinku order is weaker than it's ever been because of zed's betrayal zed saying no you and i are alike oh that's gotta that's gotta <laughs> sting it's gotta sting hard but he has to kind of swallow this because hey the golden demon has escaped and as we touch on especially in our Jin episode this the hunt for the golden demon is what began all of the deterioration of their mental and spiritual health to get Zed and Shin at the point where the Kenku order breaks apart. Mm -hmm. So the golden demon being on the run is the only thing that could ever bring these two back together. And that's what Zed wants. Zed is like, I, I need help. Like Shin can see how tired he is on his face, but 
all this shit talking aside, Zed is asking for help. Yes. Like that, and this is going to be important one because this is what gets the band back together at least for one more tour. And two, <laughs> this is going to be a turning point for a character that we haven't gotten to talk about a lot on our show, which is Akali. Yes. Because at this point, Akali is still with the Kinku Order and training to be the apprentice for Shin. Yep. Like, Shin had ver has very high hopes for Akali, but Akali's going to be a part of the Order while Shin goes to track down a serial killer with the murderer of his father, which is very much not dealing with the spiritual realm. <laughs> <laughs> but so, just by definition. By <laughs> definition. <laughs> so the next thing that happens is, you know, as Zed tells him this, Zed purposely puts himself within killing distance and Shen hesitates and he starts to think back to that first body of a victim from the golden demon that they saw. And that day that changed both Shen and Zed and kind of put them, you know, it changed Shen, it broke Zed and it put them in the situation they're in now. And he puts his swords on the table. He looks at his bowl of soup, which is now ready. And he has lost his appetite yeah and th this would be a really cool scene to have animated because mm -hmm. you know we get the description that shin has you know he has positioned himself to be ready to strike zed if he comes in a killing distance uh so we know that he shifted and grabbed his weapons but it would be cool to see it animated because it's like yeah everybody in that room knows he's armed yeah zed's not fooled by it at all but then, like, it would be that ninja moment of just like, hey, how many weapons have you got on you right now? And then just all these blades coming out of nowhere. I, I, <laughs> like, I think this would be a cool scene to have animated because it's like it builds the story while also showing you how deadly these guys are. Yeah. Um, but that's going to take us to part three. Yes. Uh, they were forced to essentially be investigators. You know, they, first right. of all, they were forced to be beat cops and then they became investigators. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's completely yeah. outside of the goal. Um, but now it's become so so much a part of their life that they're forced to do it. And the other part is we're now in an, in an Ionian situation and just a, a Runeterra situation where there's a lot of wars going on. The Noxus invasion has happened. The world has changed for these peaceful people that they've never experienced before, which is going to kind of play into everything here. Yeah. And so th that's where we now have this scene set for going back to Jin. Yes. And Jen getting ready for his performance. And now we get to know that like the setup that the maid is do was doing for him was a lot of defensive measures yeah. because he knows that Zed is hunting him. Jen knows that Zed is hunting him and we cover it in our Jen, our Jen episode. A big reason for that is one of his first, you know, artistic displays after getting out of the Tula monastery was to go on a killing spree of Yanle or Yunle uh, ninjas so zed's disciples like jen goes and starts gunning them down because these are the guys <laughs> that arrested me <laughs> like so he knows that zed is going to be coming after him and we learned that these lanterns are a way for him to like gauge the distances which also makes sense because he's a shoot he, he's a marksman like uh, it's very important when you're taking longer shots to know to gauge that distance so you can aim properly so the and we got Jen blending into the crowd, checking his lanterns, and he is ready for action as he goes to perform his art. But he's still in a little bit of a sour mood because that woman's face was just not right. And he's got to figure out how to fix that, too. Yeah. And Jin had a sense that not only Zed would come, but he knew he would go get Shen, right, reluctantly. And... Shen does arrive after all this setup. We get a sense Shen arrives and he gets immediately questioned by villagers, um, people in this village of why would Jin do such a thing to the maid and the councilman. And at this point, he's yet to see what has happened, but he has experienced what has happened over and over and over again. And that's when we get the call here to Akali who's standing by his side, who's urging to do this, to step in and investigate what's going on because she's young at this point. She wants to get her, you know, feet wet, essentially. Um, so she's eager to do this and he stops her. And we know Akali's personality is more forward um, than Shen's. And she asks why. 
uh, does he think that she's not ready to do this? And he responds, quote, because I wasn't when I was your age. And we know this is referring to what happened to him and Zed, what they witnessed and what changed them forever. Yep. And we don't have to wait too long to, you know, kind of get a depiction of just how horrific all this can be, because while, you know, Shen is trying to keep a, a Kali on a short leash, a a guardsman walks into the room. He's stumbling. His face is white. And then all he says is her flesh. It was. It was. And then he passes out yeah. in shock. And we've talked about in our Jen episode that a lot of what the golden demon, uh, you know, these murders that Jen pulled off, uh, that it was, you know, these artistic displays, but it was in legend at that point because it was all over Ionia and everyone experienced it without knowing how it happened. So as soon as the guy hits the ground, the barkeep, the barkeep is, uh, you know, kind of laughs to himself. And then starts freaking out because he gets realizing that, hey, this matches the stories I keep hearing in this bar all the time. He saw it. He saw the flower. Yeah. The flower being what Jin does to his victims. Uh, and also a beautiful call out to how he works in League of Legends. Because, yep. you know, if he gets a kill, that lotus petal's coming. <laughs> yep. The flavor is there. Um, and a callback to, you know, one of the recent cards. Uh, what was it? Gruesome. Oh, goodness. Oh, uh, man, it's so new. I already forgot. <laughs> and, and like geniuses, we, we both like put the Gruesome cards away Theater because it's like... <laughs> is the card where if you look at it, you see the flower there. The stage hand is another card where there is a lotus flower as well. Like the representation of this flower is everywhere when it comes to gin. So it's almost like a where's Waldo situation. <laughs> Yep. Um, but that being said, yes, you, you have these depictions of all these, you know, innocent town folk that are being that are seeing the most gruesome thing they've ever seen. And their response to it is madness. And in the distance, we go back to Jen, who is admiring Shen protecting Akali from this site, for one, um, as he knows that he's been successful. Right. His performance was a success. And. So continues the pursuit time after time again, forcing Shen and Zed to work together. And that's become part of his art, right? That's been incorporated because when, you know, kind of call back to our last episode, when Jin was being restrained or, you know, he was in the prison, quote unquote, he was learning, but he was also around the order. And these people became part of his purpose, became part of his masterpiece as he calls it the shock the awe the fear everything that's them wrapped up into a into a present with a little bow on top and as he's now heading towards zon right he's reveling in the the steps that he's taking successfully towards creating his true masterpiece and when he does truly revealing himself yeah uh, the more, the more like the of uh, you explaining it, because when I read this story, I keep envisioning that it's happening like on a Dawkins on. Yes, yeah. But it does, it does make way more sense uh, with the way you're explaining it that it would be like before heading out to Zon. Um, yeah. But I, the bottom line is that you know this, this is only the beginning for Jin because he has to shape and mold Zed and Shin into the pieces that he wants them to be before yeah. he can actually work on his masterpiece and like to build into that masterpiece these this killing here uh, like as far as bringing zen and shed uh shin and zed back together to track down the golden demon once again is only the beginning of his masterpiece and that brings us to part 4 and part four being whatever happens next, because that is where we end it off. That is, is the just twist. the intro to part four. <laughs> like I, I like it really is just kind of like so fitting to end it this way because it makes you really question like what Jen's motives are, who's paying Jen uh, behind the scenes because clearly whoever's paying him needs them needs to Jen to leave Ionia. Um, and it also, you know, kind of, you know, brings to question, like what's going to happen 
to not only Zed and Shin, but Akali is clearly now a part of it because Akali's now witnessed the first, you know, her first murder that the Golden Demon has pulled off. And there's no way that like Akali is a person we don't we haven't talked about her biography here yeah. at all, but Akali is a very just person. Um, and the what sets her apart from the other like ninja like characters is that she doesn't really care about the spiritual world. Yeah, uh, she is much more like Zed, where it's like you know I want to you know defend like a sense of justice. You know I think we should be more like police. So there's no way that Shed's gonna be able to tell Akali like okay, well you stay here, I'm off to work. <laughs> like <laughs> no, like it's like no, you need a partner in this, and I'm gonna go with you. And who knows what happens? Yeah, this is where our story leaves off. But, you know, this has been a long one. We're going to keep going. So if you want to bounce out here, feel free. But we want to talk about what we think Jin's masterpiece will ultimately be. So, Hedge, what do you think his final masterpiece will be? Well, the I, I'm going to argue that I don't really know what his final masterpiece is going to be. Uh, but I do think I know what's going to be happening next. Uh, cause a very long time ago, it's so hard to like dig it up now. Cause I wanted to have it off to the side when we did this episode and I can't find it again. Yeah. It, it, it's buried deep, but we, uh, back when Camille got introduced into, uh, League of Legends universe. So it was first time her dropping as a character. We got this really cool, uh, kind of you know animated video of you know showing off the champions. I think it was an intro for one of the League of Legends rank seasons, and in that video, a big part of this reveal when they were going over Piltover and Zon characters was Caitlyn and Vi tracking down Camille. Um, and a really quick brief on Camille is she's like the, she's a godmother of a crime family, essentially. Mm -hmm. that, that is keeping it really short, God. <laughs> but um, the, so they're tracking down Camille. They track Camille down to this theater, and it turns out that Camille is tracking down someone who's been killing her subordinates so it's like okay you've killed enough of my people it's time for me to take care of the business so there's this big massive scene of the enforcers and camille all crashing into this theater and the theater is empty and on stage is Jin. and then that that's the end of that little cinematic it is uh, in essence about like 15 seconds long yeah uh it's very short but I think that there's going to be like this kind of, you know, you know, to play off of Jin's words, there's the crescendo is going to be the enforcers and the underworld of Zon joining the hunt for Jin. And there's going to be some kind of clash with them and these, you know, spiritual warriors from Ionia because Shen and Zed are clearly on the hunt. And what ends up happening there, I don't know. I like, what like do you actually have them arrest Jin? Or does like is Jin gonna get out of there without killing someone? That doesn't make any sense to me. Like someone's gotta die if Jin's involved, and if Zed is there, he's not gonna let Jin walk away alive again. And I doubt Shin will either, because Shin was against keeping him alive as well. He was just not nearly as broken spiritually as Zed was. So. Who knows? But I think that there's going to be this really dramatic showdown between all of these big parties in one location. Yeah, I'm on the same, we're on the same wavelength there. I think ultimately, and this is a reference to the card stagehand, and not just the card, the art and the quote, where in the picture, the woman is essentially atoning for sins by sacrificing herself, right? She's an ephemeral card. We don't know how ephemeral cards work. Um, but when ephemeral cards come out, they usually kill something along with themselves. And I feel Jin's final performance is a murder suicide in which he wants to both take out everyone that he's been collecting his pieces as well as himself. He wants to be the one to do it in the most beautiful fashion, right? Um, ultimately, ultimately for a story like an arcane, you're not going to have Jin kill off all those main characters. But I think oh, yeah, that's his not. goal 
is to say, I will kill myself and you all in the most beautiful fashion, and we will all go together in magnificent glory, because that kind of I, fits his mentality. I, I, I mean, I like that. I just, I disagree. I don't, like, yeah. Jed doesn't strike me as someone who is, like, going to do a suicidal mm. approach to it. Um Especially because a lot of his art is, you know, him kind of looking at other people and trying to reshape them into his vision. Mm -hmm. So what? Like he's going to give up on that vision so that he can present himself and what he thinks it should be? Like, no, no. I think I think he's a psychopath that's going to keep going okay. until everybody looks the same or they're all dead. Okay. Um, but I, I do think it's going to be explosive. Like they, there's going to be a very big deal. And since it is going to be a big deal, there's no way that it's going to be confined to just the characters like in that cinematic or just the characters in the story. Because like, if there's going to be like a an old theater in Zaun that blows up, mm -hmm. the Kim Barons are going to know about it. Yeah. And if it's going to blow up, Ziggs and Jinx, they, they want to know who's... Who's yeah. the fun guy in town? Like for them, it's just going to be like, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, there's a party and we weren't invited. Yeah. Let's go. Like that's that's what it's going to be for them, too. So it's like it's going to I think like Jid could be a character that could serve as a catalyst for like the next big story in Arcane. Yeah. Because right now we're definitely focused on Jinx, you know, that transition from powder to Jinx and how that affects Piltover and Zaun, the two cities, is going to affect them both because there's now this new psychopath in town. But like once we finish telling that story, you what like it's gonna be, be all peace, love, and everything after that? No. No, this would be a great catalyst into the next big thing. Okay. Because they already have like I mean, th just this con like this little short story here is substantial, and that gives you so much to build off of. So I, I think whatever happens is gonna be big, but I would love for it to be this because the it could be the catalyst for the next turn for Arcane. Good point. Good point. It definitely keeps the story beats going. And you know, talking about story beats, we you know on this show we kind of take pride into pointing out other media and other properties that kind of have these same themes if you like what you've heard. And one thing I wanted to point out, because the whole time I've read about Jin, there's an anime, which we talk a lot about here, uh, that you may want to check out, which is Psychopaths, which has a Jin-like character in it, um, and it plays a major part in that story. So if you enjoy Jin's story, check that out. You might like the vibe of that specifically, um, because there's a call to all of this there. Yeah, uh, watch the remake. The remake of Psychopaths. Yes, the original one's. The original one isn't bad. It's slow. Yeah, uh, but the remake kind of speeds it up, and it's just as good. Yep. Yeah, and but it, you, you'll like it. You'll yeah. like it. With that, as always, it's been a long one. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with the next episode. It's been a long one of Sakuga. <laughs> 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 All right, take care, everybody.